All right, I, I continue on then. So I tell you today about the, the, the FinGen project, um, which is our instantiation of a, of a national project to take advantage of the, the um, resources that exist in, in Finland on a national healthcare level, um, and to build a, you know, a, a transformative uh, public-private partnership to get the most out of those resources for the benefit of everyone. Um, so, you know, our mission as researchers, of course, is to alleviate disease in the population, population of Finland, population of the world. Um, and, you know, the challenge in doing so has always been, of course, that new medicines and medical technologies require industry. But progress in industry relies on basic scientific discovery. And there's nothing wrong with this. And there's no, these, you know, the public and the private side, industry and the academia side should not be seen as, as opponents, but simply in partners, each of which have a role in delivering what we want to deliver for our citizens. And so the approach we've taken is that, that we need to figure out a way for basic scientific discovery and industrial innovation to work together to advance the goals of society. And in Finland, in the context of, of the biomedical research that we are doing, of course, this partnership has a very, you know, predictable life cycle. Sorry about that. Oops. Um, in which um, we partner with the Finnish citizens, the Finnish government, to develop both biobanks and utilize, in the appropriate way, national health registry data to perform basic research and then ultimately clinical research. And that research, especially on the clinical side and then the downstream um, activities that come from the um, scientific discoveries have natural partnerships with industry in order to get around this cycle to deliver back to the population healthcare interventions. We in Finland take advantage of a very unique um, uh, situation favorable for this type of research partnership, which is the Finnish Biobank Act passed remarkably in 2013 by, by, the, by the Finnish parliament which describes and prescribes how we can utilize national healthcare data, how we can create biobanks with a broad consent such that individuals consenting join the biobank, um, consent for all approved medical research that then takes place downstream on the biobank, not consent for each individual study. Um, and importantly, outlined how existing legacy epidemiologic samples could be transferred into the biobank you know, um, uh, construction, as well as described how collaboration with industry should take place. And these laws have further been, been you know, uh, strengthened in recent years. And the upshot of the situation is as it is you know, possible in, in Denmark and other Nor Nordic countries, um, we can recruit now into a national biobank framework an individual, and when that individual is recruited and their biospecimen given, they immediately have a lifelong phenotype from a variety of national registry data. And these data in Finland go back in some cases now 50 years in terms of hospitalization records and things like causes of death, cancer registry, and so forth. And more recently, over the last 25 years, all prescription drug purchases. And these are all now available to research studies such as the FinGen project that I described. And this, as I don't have to explain to any Danish researchers, creates the possibility that we can move from single time point cross-sectional studies to longitudinal, lifelong, and dynamic views of, of health and disease and how genetics influences things more than on a single point basis. And so FinGen project is really a true public-private partnership in which Funding comes both from a set of 12 pharmaceutical companies, as well as from the Finnish government through their innovation arm, Business Finland, and partnering with all national biobanks and, and hospital districts in Finland, um, such that every Finnish researcher affiliated to a Finnish medical school or university with medical research can be a research part a participant in the activity. And the design and the and the activities that we undertake are decided collectively among 
all of the researchers in, in Finland involved and researchers at the, at the pharmaceutical companies. Now, importantly, as I said, the National Biobank law is the foundation of this. So this is grounded in, in legislature, how we conduct it and what we are able to do and what we don't do. Um, and of course, as, as you would expect, the prime importance is the security and maintaining the confidence of the population in what we are doing, both from the standpoint of what it is that we're doing, but also just in terms of nothing you know, becoming more important than the security and the consent of the individual um, to, to join this project. And so we put a lot of effort into that and come to a solution for data access and data use that is probably not too dissimilar from what you, what you just heard from, from Naomi. In our case, we, we created um, a secure, um, what we call sandbox on the Google Cloud in which individual level data, both genome data and um, pseudonymized uh, national registry phenotype data are um, brought together for the purposes of analysis. Those data never leave the secure environment that they exist in. Individuals who are partners in the project, be they from Finland, be they from overseas, um, can gain access to an analysis environment, which is in the, in the center of this picture. And this analysis environment can connect and run analyses on the individual level data, but that individual level data cannot move from its secure location. And so this creates a, you know, it's not, you know, ideal, you know, people would like to have, you know, sort of easier programmatic access, but you can build in the necessary securities, the necessary gates to um, exporting data, to connecting to the internet and so forth um, in a way that's completely secure and audited such, but allows researchers from around the world to, as Naomi described it, come to the data, bring their own analytic tools and make progress in the scientific work without compromising the security of the data. So FinGen project, I just give you a little bit of overview of where we're at and some of the now scientific things that we're doing with the project that, that is you know, really why we are building the resource in the first place. We launched the project about three years ago. Um, there are new data freezes every six months and you know, some, some statistics on uh, where the data freezes and analyses are. The current samples um, collected, uh, you know, now almost getting to the to the end of the scheduled collection, even though the analytic activities and the genotyping activities have another three years to run in the project. Um, and importantly, the results of um, data analyses after a one-year embargo period are made freely and publicly available to the entire. Um, you know, research community worldwide. And this is, you know, something that we were, you know, is, is a very important aspect of the, the commitment we make to building the resource in a way that's useful for, you know, biomedical research around the world, not simply for a closed group of, of you know, pharmaceutical companies or, or Finnish researchers. From that type of um, you know, sort of, you know, infrastructure and, and public facing project, um, Andrea Ghana and I and a few others were able to um, reach out to, you know, colleagues who had biobanks and clinical studies around the world and launch with the same mindset of a very publicly open, you know, research program, a COVID-19 host genetics initiative, which I'm not going to go into now, but which has been making great progress and has, has released on a regular monthly basis, um, genetic findings from uh, aggregated study results from around the world. And this has, has provided already now a number of you know, genetic clues to why individuals in particular have either a very mild or very severe course of, um, in of disease after SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, but coming back to the, you know, the main thing that we have been focused on in the FinGen project is what can we learn about human disease from building and constructing this kind of a resource with lifelong medical data and national, you know, large-scale population genetics data. And so we began, um, you know, about 
year, year and a half ago to really get the, the project to a scale where we were beginning to um, be able to perform genetic studies. And for most diseases, the first you know, few years of, of genetic studies, we would expect to simply rediscover genetic you know, discoveries that had been made over the past decade. So we're studying inflammatory bowel disease, there's been global collaborations that I've been involved in for almost you know, 15 years now, um, working on the discovery of genes for IBD. So we do not expect to find new discoveries at any early point in the project. But we're surprised that actually the most significant genetic finding you know, across the entire genome was a completely novel genetic locus that had never been documented before. And after you know, sort of berating poor Yuha for a few days to, to have him figure out what, what had gone wrong, that there was some weird peak on chromosome seven, um, he returned and, and we decided that this was actually a genuine discovery, albeit unexpected in how strong and significant it was, um, which was associated not only to IBD, but also to several other um, you know, a constellation of inflammatory diseases, such as ankylosing spondylitis and, and iridocyclitis. Um, and so we naturally asked how this could have been missed. And as it turns out, this was a variant that is almost uniquely found in Finland. It's found at the, at the somewhat lower frequency, but, but you know, meaningful frequency in the linguistic colleague, the linguistic you know, uh, friends in Estonia. Um, but other than that, the variant is extraordinarily rare, even in the rest of Europe. And so this gives an easy explanation to how it was not discovered in any other um, population study previously, and reminds us of the other opportunity that we have, uh, the uniqueness of, of Finland, um, which is unlike the national registry system, um, this element of Finland is not shared with, with most of our Nordic neighbors. Um, and that is that because of linguistic and geographic isolation, um, the Finnish population largely dates back to a relatively small number of founders um, 100 to 120 generations ago. And because of that linguistic and geographic isolation, the modern day population largely derives its genomes from that small founding population. This has been the well-known work in work of Lena Feldman and, and many others um, describing what's known as a Finnish disease heritage. And similar to other relatively isolated populations, such as Ashkenazi Jews, um, there are characteristic recessive diseases that are seen as a very high frequency in Finland compared to the rest of the world. And that's because specific damaging mutations just happen to get lucky and come through these types of population bottleneck events then rise to a large frequency. And what we were seeing with that genetic variant in IBD was in fact that type of pattern happening for a common disease. And so then we thought to ask, how often would this be happening generally throughout the genome? And so my colleague in Boston, Conrad Karczewski, who's been working with me on the NOMAD project for many years, um, simply evaluated the difference between the Finnish population and the um, sort of main European population, which we call non-Finnish Europeans, and found that there are actually thousands and thousands of missense and loss of function variants um, in the Finnish population at a relatively high frequency that are not seen or at a much rarer frequency in the rest of Europe. Um, and so this creates a great opportunity for discovery that we have not had an opportunity to, to see unless someone has previously done a large scale study of any of these diseases in the Finnish population or to some extent in the Estonian population um, previously. And so we begin to see with this resource that in almost every common disease, we not only can recapitulate many previous genetic discoveries, but in fact, find a number of novel findings that correspond to these particular alleles that are common in Finland, but extremely rare in other parts of the world. And these give us great new insights into the biology of disease, and it applies to almost every common disease. So that's you know, one thing that we're doing, we're very you know, enthusiastic about that and, and, and so forth, but that's only really beginning as you 
well appreciate in, in Denmark to scratch the surface of what can be done with these types of data resources. And so we've begun in the last year exploring what types of new analyses are now possible with lifelong medical data. And so with the decades of medical information, diagnoses, medications, and so forth, we actually end up with hundreds of health events per individual, uh, hundreds of drug purchases, and many other types of health events per individual. And so this gives a great opportunity to do a number of interesting things. Um, we can look, for example, at the long-term response to long-term use or adverse response to long-term use of almost any common drugs, for example, statins, and switching between statins, scaling up to a more significant statin, or abandoning statins altogether because of adverse response. All of these types of things you can see now have we reached the scale at which we can start to explore these. We can look at a number of you know, medical phenotypes derived from medication use that are you know, at, a, at a clinical level that has been difficult to study um, in, a, in a genetic study because of the challenges of, of ascertainment and collection of the, of the information. And so here in looking at the number of antibiotics and individual purchases, and these are all in examining only adults at this point, um, so as not to have a spiking in of, of childhood antibiotic use, um, we can actually perform a genetic survey to un identify what are the genetic risk factors that place you at the higher likelihood of being a being take, taking over 25 years a large number of antibiotics. Some of these genetic factors map onto um, well-known disease risk factors that explain why you might be getting a lot of antibiotics. But there are a number of others that are uncharacterized or unassociated to previous diseases at all, and so likely constitute different susceptibilities in the immune system of a milder variety that wouldn't get captured, for example, in studying more severe immune disease. Um, we can, of course, and, and Wei Zhu, working with Runak Day and Ji Hong Lin's lab, has worked with us um, in, in the group in Boston and working on the FinGen project to develop new methods for performing efficient genome-wide studies of survival phenotypes. So how long you would, in this case, survive after a diagnosis of arthrosis to developing a more severe complication such as requiring hip surgery. And so these types of secondary scans, and especially with respect to diabetes onset and then diabetic complications, we now have an ability to really merge efficient computational approaches with the richness of the national healthcare data to allow us to perform population-wide studies at the scale that we haven't had the opportunity to, to look at previously. Um, I wanted to say just a moment about the importance of, of in addition to sort of predicting outcomes and looking at longitudinal um, you know, traits, the opportunity that we have with respect to polygenic risk prediction. And I think uh, this has been in some cases and venues significantly overstated in its importance in terms of, you know, we have a lot of, you know, measurable risk predictors for cardiovascular disease and diabetes. The genetic factors certainly add a little bit to that, but not demonstrably. But with respect to cancer risk, um, we really lack, um, you know, a lot of, you know, any effective predictors that you can measure in a person, yet we do have importantly, significant interventions in terms of more aggressive screening that can be done and absolutely would save lives and, and medical costs. And so Nina Mars here working with Donnelly Rafati has used the FinGen resource to explore this question in the, in the case of breast cancer in, in work that's just in the process of being published. And what's quite interesting about what, what Nina has demonstrated is that with respect to breast cancer, we can perform in Finland a genetic study that identifies many known genetic factors, but also since that founding bottleneck exists, our straightforward genetic study can capture also 
higher penetrance mutations that happen to come through that finished bottleneck. And so the, the very strong effects of, of loss of function mutations in PALV2 and CHECK2 um, stand out in the, in the genetic study as it is. And so what Salmoni and Nina then did was explore not only the risk in the population to individuals who carry a PALV2 mutation, but then layered on top of that, the polygenic risk, so the signal from the background and the rest of the genome. And you can see quite definitively that individuals can be identified with the polygenic signal and a rare mutation that have an extremely high risk um, of disease lifetime. Whereas individuals who have a low polygenic background, it almost completely counters the risk from this high penetrance um, mutation. And so this improvement that we can now offer not only in assessing individuals who show up with disease, but in then reaching out to their first and second degree relatives to assess their risk can now be done in a much more definitively informative way. And this will be, I think, really one of the most important ways in which we give back information to the Finnish population and really return value from this work. And so um, I will probably stop here because I think that that was the, the allotted time. There's also a whole raft of things I could tell you about rare disease studies that we can, we can extract from this um, FinGen resource. But I think you can imagine how both rare diseases when you get to an entire national scale for the genetic study can now be efficiently um, identified as well as, as almost Mendelian effects that one can turn up. And in fact, um, we've identified a number of new rare recessive diseases with this resource. In fact, a high penetrance early onset forms of cataract and hearing loss that um, can now also be used in the, in the clinical setting to help the population. And so with that, I think we are now starting to deliver on, on these. We're just really still at the, at the earliest stages because the first years of this program are, of course, mostly to build the infrastructure to begin to collect and then collect the genotypes and organize the data and so forth. And now we're really getting into the, the fun part of the program. And I would be very happy to take any questions or discuss any other issues that um, might arise um, that are of interest to all of you. Okay, thank you very much, Mark.